Michigan, basically, I think, is Michigan has more brain power than Silicon Valley. Where it's different in Michigan is that that brain power is in amongst those same people that manufactured the automobile. What I believe we have here, and this can be put in quotes, is middle class think tank. But they just don't recognize themselves as a think tank. I was at the Woodward Cruise, the Woodward, uh, the Woodward Cruise, I don't know if people know what that is, but that's a, where a collection of old cars come in and they ride, ride down Woodward. Now, I'm so glad that Michigan started those cruises because it should have started here. You can get into a conversation with people on the street that live in Michigan that know more about cars than anywhere in the world. They'll say, oh, there goes a 1957 uh, Chevrolet. Oh, a nice car. You know they had four different carburetors for that car? <laughs> and these people know that. The rear end was different on this one, though. And they, talk, and they just know this information. I saw that parody on TV the other day. I think it was uh, uh, Smilovich and one of those guys were talking about it, and they were saying, you know, hey, we can talk cars here forever. An average person from another state, from another location, from another region has no idea what's going on. Now, I love Michigan. I don't know any place else. Probably that's why. But at the same time, not only Michigan, but this region, the Southeast Michigan region, has to be aware of what their brain power is. They basically got a think tank with maybe half to maybe a, 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 a million people involved in and amongst that think tank. But they just don't realize that they're a think tank. That's why everybody looks at this area as the place to do something, whatever it is. You got two great universities here, well, a number of great universities here, uh, starting with U of M and Michigan State. And the biggest university that they have, though, is amongst the middle class worker, the middle class manufacturer, the middle class guy that knows automobiles, but not only that, put the automobile together. These are the people that talk in and amongst the cruises. When you go to these cruises, Wilbur Cruise, Grasset Cruise, Harper Cruise, um, Down River Cruise, I can't remember what they call it. Um, but all of these cruises bring out this, this think tank, this middle class think tank that nobody's aware of, nobody recognizes. And the think tank itself, the middle class think tank itself, has no idea what their brain power is because they don't recognize themselves. So how many people do you think a factory like this could hire? Here we believe we could have an industry that's the size of the automobile especially if we protect it, keep it in-house, and then export it to the world, like we used to do automobiles before Engler. Engler sent it off to China, and then he became the head of the people that he helped send, off, send the stuff off to China. He became the head of a, the, the Manufacturing Association, which is like, what? You know, like, come on. Yeah. So they're not protecting manufacturing, which means they're not protecting the middle class. I would go as far as saying that Engler and his cronies basically destroyed the original middle class, which is here in Michigan. And everyone looks here and says, well, oh, you, know, you can make a decent living without being an engineer, without being the boss. You can make a decent living here. And that's a good thing. More and more people would make a decent living. 
with this aircraft will recreate the automobile industry but now we're talking something that would last into the year 21 and continue you're talking into the 22nd century these jobs this lifestyle this income could be garnered in. We've always had problems getting venture capital. The project is too forward for some people. Because we've been working on it for 30 years, it's becoming a simple, a simple fix in that we continue to upgrade we continue to work on the project so that the project becomes more simple now. We know about the materials we need. We'll probably use carbon fiber reinforced with Kevlar. Um, the weight will be significantly reduced as it deals with aircraft. Most of the aircraft that are being built now, about 80% of it is, is carbon fiber. And we'll be using that. And we believe that we need about a half million dollars to put the project together right. Uh, half of that will be used in uh, supercomputer design development, which this project was part of as NASA continued to finish developing that. We were there. When, this, when those first ideas about lead design, using supercomputers to lead design. Up to that point, they've been using supercomputers to solve problems and etc. But we came up with, and or we thought about using supercomputers to lead design back in 80, what is 90, uh, would have been probably 91. 92, somewhere in that area. And we went to the initial meeting where NASA used supercomputers to design and or they had a program where they were using supercomputer design. We just happened to be there. <laughs> Say it like that. And uh, we were invited. I went over. And generally that has become standard now with automotive, aerospace, etc. The point being that we believe we're on the cutting edge, not only of this design, but lead designs as it deals with concepts, as it deals with theory, as it deals with themes. The theory of flight, vertical lift, vertical descent, the theory of fuel or non-use of fuel, converting air into fuel as we transport so that we don't need four or five thousand pounds of batteries. We don't need that because we're converting as we go. All we need is a starter battery, which would probably be a lesser weight than what you see in a car battery today, okay, to get us going. And we'll probably, probably be a cell type battery is what it would end up being. But nothing like you see in the automobiles as they go together now. Uh, they have to have, I don't know how much those things weigh. They weigh pounds. And generally, they can run for 40 miles before they're depleted. The batteries are depleted and they have to go to some other system, some buddy system, or, or they better pull it in the garage. We don't need that. We don't need the batteries, that storage space for the batteries, that weight. We, we can't use that. Can't have weight like that on an aircraft. So that with that being the case, we believe that our ideas are on the cusp and on the leading edge of all things, not just in flight, but in power. Okay? And not just in power, but in safety. How do you how do you see one of those systems working for our average American household? 
What do you mean? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, how, how do you see uh, pretty much one of those uh, crafts uh, used in an American household? How many people would it carry and how much would be the price of it? Mm -hmm. We're working on two, two versions of the, of the vehicle. Our main theme would be a five passenger, um, which would be a personal aircraft which would land in your backyard or on your driveway or on your side driveway that you put in. Uh, we see it carrying five people, okay? And we also see it as a vehicle that not replaces, it doesn't replace the automobile, but it works in concert with the automobile. If you need to go to the store two miles away, you can go to the store and land in the back of the parking lot. But if you need to go up north, now you can go up north every other day if you want to. We think that we can get this thing sold. Initially it will be expensive. But we're thinking that initially it will start off between 600 and a million dollars, six hundred thousand to a million dollars. Eventually, we'll be able to get that price down to under forty-five thousand dollars for the average person. From the time you're getting uh, the five hundred thousand dollars for the back uh, out of the backers for the prototype, how long do you think it would take you to uh, actually have this thing in the air? If we could get a half million dollars, we'd have the the prototype in the air in eighteen months. 18 months after we've done the supercomputer programming that we need to do on the lead design. After that, 18 months, we'll be in there. I used to work for a boat, boat manufacturer over here in uh, Anchor Bay. And um, we put things together, you know, boat-wise. You're talking about original concepts, and, and I've seen it all done. And... Um, worked on it myself. Again, the middle class think tank thing. Going back to that, you know, not only have I seen it done, I've worked on it. Worked on the uh, gel coat bodies of the of those boats. Well, instead of using gel coat, we'll be using carbon fiber, reinforced with Kevlar, about 15% of the weight as normally as in those, they call them turds, when those boats are so heavy like that, you know, they use fiberglass. But we're getting rid of all of that. Rid of gel coat, that's too heavy. We'll put paint on it, and basically it'll be carbon fiber reinforced with Kevlar. This was a mock-up. A mock-up so that we could see what the space would look like, how much space we would have inside for the, for the passengers, how much space we would have inside for the propeller blades that draw in the air and compress it. And uh, this gave us a real good idea about what it would take to do the prototype. So that I used to work on those in a, in a boat shop. I used to work on those boats and figured out how to do fiberglass and the whole bit, even though this is going to be made out of uh, carbon fiber and uh, Kevlar. But we got a good day, or the sun is out today, and uh, we're able to look at this and see. But these are inlet holes. These inlet holes and uh, ingest air, compress the air, send it out the bottom. 